we went to the local collectible slash comics shop in our town and uh, we found some hidden gems. Or so, uh, experience more of it. From 1955 all the way up until about mid 80s, uh, Disneyland only charged a general admission. That did not mean you got to ride the rides. You had to pay extra for that. So pretty much like your county or state fair. Mm -hmm. So what they ended up doing is selling these ticket books or individual tickets for the attraction in question. And we got some D tickets. Four of them to be exact. I wanted to try to get as many different tickets as possible and they ended up being four dollars each and there were a lot of unique tickets they have like a stack so so what are some uh no longer there rides that are on these d tickets gee let's go over some of them shall we just this top one right here i can count um all of them <laughs> just Can about you, what's the date on that one it doesn't have one that's the thing they don't have dates they don't have dates oh this okay i see now it just lists like a bunch of suggested d ticket attractions but at the bottom it says or any other d attraction okay okay they were like 60 cents a peach peach piece <laughs> 60 cents for a d ticket 60 cents for a d ticket yeah um, Can you tell if they came from a booklet or would they have been? They definitely came from a booklet because they have these perforations right there. So mm. I don't know if they show up on camera. But yeah, let's go over some of the long gone attractions on the. Cringed yet, collectors? Anyway. <laughs> Agent of Chaos. Anyway, so we have on Main Street. The SF and DRR trains through Grand Canyon and Primeval World, that's still there. Mm -hmm. Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, that's still there, upgraded throughout the years. Then we move to Tomorrowland. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a bunch of things that aren't there anymore, like Flight to the Moon. That is now the Red Rockets Pizza Port, or the Aliens Pizza Planet, currently. When did Flight to the Moon close? Do oh, God. Um, whenever they transitioned to um, Mission to Mars. That's, that tells me nothing. That's probably about the same. Um, I want to say after the first iteration when they... After they moved away from like... <laughs> essentially... Actually trying to future plan. Showroom <laughs> floor for... Yeah. You know, consumer electronics. World's Fair. World's Fair, consumer, you know, gizmos and gadgets, because it's the 50s. Um, <laughs> when they moved away from that to actually, like, kind of going into, like, space exploration and sci-fi and all that stuff. Or, like, world on the move sort of thing. Or the land in motion, I think it was called. Um, when they put in the people mover tracks and when they put in the... No, they're not there. Um, put in the Skyway the and subs. the submarines when those were put in. They're not on here, oddly enough. So I'm Would they guessing... have been a C ticket or an, or an E ticket? I think the subs were an E ticket. The subs and the Matterhorn were definitely E tickets. Can you imagine being the cheapskate to only buy t D tickets when taking your kids to Disney? Honestly, this would still be a really good trip to Disneyland <laughs> for it me. It would. It because there's also the the uh, the, Sky the Skyway way. to and from Fantasyland and Tomorrowland. Mm -hmm. I think it was just like a one-way trip either way, but you could ride the Skyway through the Matterhorn either way and just get like you know a bird's eye view of everybody down on the ground in Disneyland. Like I ah oh, wish I could have that now. The closest you can get to that is the monorail, the monorail. through Tomorrowland. Yeah. Or if you're like sitting on the very edge of the outward facing trains uh, going around, it's about kind of like that. And then it also has the people mover. It's here. 
So this would have been a time when there was both Flight to the Moon and People Mover. Yeah. So probably right in the transitional space, uh, transitional period before. Because actually, I think Mission to Mars was put in. May. Not the 90s, no, because not the 80s, earlier than that, 70s. probably the 70s, because right around the time they built Space Mountain. So these would have been maybe like late 60s, early 70s? Mm, as far as dating them? I want to say probably mid... Mm, mid 70s? No, because... They all look from the same booklet, obviously. Because People Mover... Because the Skyway, People Mover, Flight to the Moon, and Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, along with Primeval World, with the Grand Canyon, like, uh, panorama, not panorama. Diorama. Dioramas. They had to be in existence at the same time. Mm -hmm. Without, you know, Flight to the, uh, Mission to Mars existing as well. So, we need to fact check future her. Yeah. Um, I did other than that, that's basically also, the same line. Also, it has Mind Train Through Nature's Wonderland yeah, on there. Yeah, one of them has the Mind Train Through Nature's Wonderland. But if they're all from the same booklet, that dates it as well. I don't think they're from the same booklet. Because the, these are like... How the logos though. It doesn't matter. It's, the logos don't really say much about them either. Um, are you looking at like the serial The numbers? serial number's right here. Because anybody with more knowledge about these than we do, uh, go ahead and drop a comment. Did anyone ever used to watch History Detectives on PBS? Because this is what this feels like. Like like me watching History Detectives. Because I feel these two are from the same booklet. Yes, given the serial numbers. Because mm -hmm. it's like T094536 and T095434. But given theme park ops, I don't think there's like more than a couple years between these and these. Oh no, definitely, definitely they're, not. They're all from the same era. They might not be like from the exact same booklet, but they're from the same era. Yeah. Because given that we work in a theme park, we know that tickets and especially like ephemera like this changes design a lot. This one also has the Tomorrowland Jets on top of that uh, on mm -hmm. this one. So, yeah, this one right here. Because not only does that, like, keep things fresh for guests to look at, it's it's also a way to cut down on fraud. <laughs> yeah, because these are, like, I mean, it's pretty basic anyway, but, yeah. Because if you change a design every couple years, then people can't, like, hoard or copy old designs. All right, but the PS de resistance. Yeah, we just came across these, like, I, I, the moment I saw these, I honed in on them, and I was just I like, I, I swear need them. swear the shop did not know what they had. I need them. Um, they are a couple of magazines from the, I don't even know what to call these. This one's uh, winter of 88, 89, and this one is winter, winter of 89, 90. 90. It's I, called the E-Ticket. It's called the E-Ticket. They're a fanzine. Uh, there's a Wikipedia article on them, which I'm going to read for you now. I don't know any of this information, so yay. I know part of it because she told me, but anyway. The E-Ticket was a fanzine devoted to the history of Disneyland and its attractions, especially the park as it existed during the lifetime of Walt Disney. Publishing 46 issues, between 1986 and 2009. It was edited and- Wow! Yeah. It was edited and published by Disneyland fans, Leon and Jack Jansen, until Leon's sudden death on September 9th, 2003. Oh, dude. The last issue published by the brothers was the fall 2003 issue number 40 on Adventure Through Inner Space. Jack continued the magazine without his brother, beginning with issue 41 in 2004. In the final issue, 46, in summer of 2009, Jack noted that making the magazine hasn't been much fun without Leon, and he decided to end the magazine's run. Disney and animation historian Michael Barrier has cited it as an extremely valuable record, one that can no longer be duplicated given the deaths of most of the interview subjects. 
The magazine, including all remaining backstock, was sold in 2009 to the Walt Disney Family Foundation to augment the historic resources of the Walt Disney Family Museum it established that year. Back issues of the e-ticket are sold at the museum's bookstore. So when... <laughs> this is rare. <laughs> Yeah, and how much did we get these for? Like six ninety nine a piece. Yeah. Cause um, let's, let's just thumb through it a bit. All right, let me. Let's. Not only like the I, art. I noticed is, this microphone is, but uh, they're out of focus a little bit. But you can kind of see the hitchhiking ghost in this corner, right there. It's very indicative of. Um, fanzines from like the 60s through the 90s because everything was photocopied. That's how they were able to distribute um, to other people. Now, I, I want to point this out. This blew my mind the moment we opened this. Entirely Disneyland uh, cover. Knott's Berry Farm inside. Which I thought it was <laughs> like a souvenir booklet like to put Same. stickers and stuff in. Same. Um, which would have been cool too, but then like the idea that this is a fanzine is so flipping exciting because it's not just Disney, it's all the SoCal parks and it's supplementing the fandom for them. This is a piece of fandom archival history. It's talking about Pacific Ocean Park at um, Santa Monica. Yeah, Santa Monica Pier. Oh, we've been there. Mm-hmm. It did not look like that. <laughs> no, it didn't. That's some beautiful Gucci. Yep, that's... A version of Pacific Ocean Park. <laughs> kind of a map right there. Like this, this is so exciting to me for that kind of history. Yeah. And anthropology standpoint. There's things where you could submit your theme park memories to the fanzine. And there's like little personal ads like seeking Mickey Minnie salt shaker thing. And they had interviews. This is gonna be a great resource because this was also made at a time when they had better like access to the creators than we do now. Hey, Yesterworld, would you like hey, me to Hey, Land, we got the freaking like scoop. This. We got the scoop. Now, granted, this these resources have probably been dumped on the internet several times over, so. Theoretically. Theoretically, what is in these is probably... Common knowledge somewhere. Somewhat public common knowledge. But I will... But because of the age of the internet, a lot of that is probably stuck in the Wayback Machine or in forums no one visits anymore. Um, I ran into that problem researching the Tiki Room. So to have like a physical oh resource Oh my god, right to have here, a friggin' physical resource on the Tiki Room, like from this yeah. series. Oh. <laughs> Problematic advertising. Ah. I'm gonna be doing that a lot, sorry. Yeah, you are. The Disneyland game. Huh. That's interesting. Looks like it came with a globe. Yeah. And th these are like the pers like the one ads or personal ad things. Cause yeah, like this, this, is... this is a pre-internet way of collecting. Cause it's all this like souvenirs and things that aren't sold anymore so what else could you do but put an ad in a fanzine now what i also kind of saw or what i also saw when i actually looked at the back of this and kind of thumbed through it this was published out of saugus california that's a hop skip and a jump away from us like to give personal family history my dad used to race at the saugus speedway racetrack so, yeah. And if you want internet ties to the Saga Speedway, the intro to Plumbers Don't Wear Ties has photographs at Saga Speedway. What's Plumbers Don't Wear Ties? It's a really bad semi-pornographic 3DO game. Gotcha. I won't be looking that one up. It, it has no nudity whatsoever in it, except for just, like, man butt. Man man but I don't know if the guy is still living the other guy yeah. yeah I mean it's entirely possible here here we go yeah Tomorrowland and the back of it has there's Mr. Walt outside of Fantasyland outside of Sleeping Beauty Castle um 1955 
Oh my god. It's gosh. got a retrospective on the flying saucers in there. Oh, that's so cool. And that's, that's the main editor. That's the guy. Jackie Jansen. Okay, this this was also really cool. Um, in the... I can't remember what segment it was. I remember the script. I remember shooting it. Actually, I think that was Star Tours. It may be the Star Tours it segment. Star Tours. Anyway, in the top 25, um, I used a PNG of the Flying Saucer, and I got that from the Patent Office um, illustration of it. That is it right there. My, they might have gotten it from the Patent Office, too. Probably did. Yeah, they did. It's right there. Yeah. U.S. Patent Office, uh, May 29th, 1962. And there's like an entire like how diagram diagrams of how this worked. Like, which would have been really useful for like remember. I don't know if your science class did this, but mine made a hoverboard or a hovercraft using this kind of technology. Mm-hmm. And we like pushed each other around the gym with it. So that would have been really useful for like little engineers. Mm -hmm. And by the way, where the pad where the flying saucers used to be is the current home of Space Mountain. So I'd say it was an upgrade. The amount of journalism and sleuthing that went into making these. Oh, definitely. Yeah, for, just to... <laughs> for little to no profit, very likely. This is all a fan endeavor. That is where Space Mountain is right now. Because you can see the what is now the Star Tour show building. And I think this show building is still here. That's the uh, Rocket to the Moon show building. This little dome thing right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, a full freaking interview with Bob Gurr, the guy behind the design of the monorail. And I want to say some of the, um, it looks like the Autopia vehicles as well. Yeah. And oh, geez, uh, <laughs> flying saucers. And a little bit of the Carousel of Pro Wow. Okay, I'm just gonna list off attractions that he's been involved in. The Viewliner, the Submarine Voyage, the Dark Rides, Matterhorn, and Carousel of Progress. So Bob Gurr got some, like- Bob was like their like, he main got vehicle some credit. designer, it looks like. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I wanna say the Viewliner was this really, not short-lived attraction, but it was still kind of like, was the predecessor to the monorail, wasn't it? No, it was, actually it may have been. I like this little illustration right here. It's at the Big Thunder barbecue. R.I.P. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> rest in peace. Pour, pour a barbecue sauce out for the homies. Pour one out for the homies. Hashtag pray for Anaheim. Um, pour one out for the goat homies. Star Wars is coming. And yeah, the, just this cow, the look on this cow's face, <laughs> it's just like, what are you doing to my home? What are you doing to my brethren? Let's just kind of show this double page spread right here. Some advertisements from there. Like these are just some like ads that they people have collected. They found old advertisements for like a, a basically an a Like fair, an amu amusement. A fair company. Yeah, an amusement company. Walt Disney's Donald Duck visits Disneyland. Uh, pop out, press out, and play. Disneyland bubble baths. That's cute. <laughs> Just like the amount of history that is in these kind of things. Corganville oh. Movie Ranch. Yeah, there's like. Is the, does that still exist? I don't know. I don't know if it has. Bring cameras, get autographs, mingle with movie stars. What? What? What have you found? Is the? Is there? Is there unfortunateness? No, that's just down the street. What? <laughs> it's, it's just down Care the street. Careful with it, dear. It's just down the street. Just recognize that town name. Yep. And that town name? Yep. And you just take the, this right up here and... Five right miles north of Chatsworth on Highway 118. Oh my god! We are going to do a field trip there now. Yes. It's probably not in operation. <laughs> no, probably not. Um, Corganville Movie Ranch. We're gonna look it up. We're gonna look it up. We're gonna go there. Um, probably not 
now. We're gonna do a follow up to this. And, I remember like and when I more, first one visited. Ads, but yeah. When I first visited with your dad, he took us to like a little western setback pot thing. I wonder if that. I was think it. that may have been it. Yeah, we need to go back. <laughs> we we need to go, go back. back. <laughs> we have to go back. <laughs> anyway. There you go. Um, this is such an exciting find. It went all the way to 2009. That's what's blowing my mind right now. And apparently now. all the back issues at, or a lot of the ones that I've seen from the Disney Family Museum are later issues. I'm betting it's really difficult to find earlier issues like these. And you said this was started in like the 80s? It started in 86. 86. So we have like just, wow, just three years into the run. So we have just three years into the run. This is like the infancy of like Disney fan. This is what we are doing now. <laughs> like any anything pre-internet fandom is fascinating to me, but this is like this kind of archive of theme park fandom in particular, because it's a very difficult fandom, especially pre-internet to find a community for. Mm -hmm. And like, if you look at, videos or vlogs or photos from the um that that's from disneyland exhibit that happened last summer in sherman oaks that's kind of what the back of the back half of this magazine is it's just like people wanting like a piece of disneyland because mm -hmm. it was that impactful to them like if and they, they remembered it from their childhood any other way to get in touch with other fans other than through things like this, which were fairly rare. And, and those D tickets reflex. are a prime example of that. Mm -hmm. Disney fandom probably would not have existed or like the fandom as we know it today would not have existed probably without, without this. this. The work that has been done here. Cause I'm all about like recognizing the labor in fandom. Because there's a lot of labor that goes into fandom. This is... And to Leon and Jack Jansen, thank you very much for your contributions to our fandom. And I'm very excited to have have this piece of history yeah. with us. Um, but yeah, uh, yes, we're up to Funkland. Um, Got the scoop! If they want more information... We, we found it. <laughs> we found, we, we, we found the raw... We found it first. We found the raws. Mine. We found the negatives. With sleuths, we sleuth it out for you. All right, so uh, you know, I wonder if it was at the the collector shop. It was because a CME resident got this issue because of Corrigan. You know what? That's probably probably why. Like that's that is entirely possible. That someone just got it because there was a personal connection in there. I wouldn't or doubt like it. Someone, someone gave them an extra issue because hey, this thing. Um, I wouldn't doubt it. And that's how it. Came. Like these things exist by chance. They endure by chance, and I love it. I love it so much. What so. what we have is like a treasure. I I would. I I don't think I would have ever come across. I, I don't. I couldn't even have dreamed I would have come across in in this crazy little subsection of nerdery that I've decided to <laughs> that I've decided to stake a claim in. Wow. Thank thank you for coming with us on this journey. Um, if you have seen any of this kind of phantom history or ephemera, or even a fanzine, if that's in your history, please comment down below and tell me about it. I, I love um, and the anthropology of fandom, duh. And, and I think that that should be archived and studied academically, so I'd love to get a conversation started. As always, like, share, subscribe, that one can be